journal continued. Den Ron. There wasn't much I could ask Uncle Press from the back of a speeding motorcycle. Between the whine of the engines, the blast of wind rushing by, and the fact that both of us were wearing these high-tech helmets, conversation was impossible. So I was left with my own imagination to try and figure out where we were going and why. One thing was clear, though. We were leaving town. Evidently quiet, peaceful, okay, dull suburban of New York City. I'd been into the city a few times with my parents, mostly to go to events like the Holiday Spectacular at Radio City or the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. Then, there was that one time you and I, Mark, hopped the com commuter train to catch the James Bond flick, remember? Other than that, the city was pretty much a, my a mystery to me. On the other hand, it didn't take a New York cabbie to realize Uncle Press was steering us into a section of the city that by anybody else's standards would be defined as bad. This was not the New York I'd ever seen, except maybe on a TV news report about some nasty crime that had gone down. Once we shot off the cross, Bronx Expressway, we were smack in the middle of the Badlands. Burned out buildings were everywhere. Nobody walked on the street. streets. It all looked empty and desolate. Yet, I had the eerie feeling that many sets of eyes were locked on us from the dark window of the derelict buildings as we cruised by. And of course, it was nighttime dark. Was I scared? Well, judging by the fact that I wanted to puke and held on to Uncle Press so hard I expected to hear one of his ribs crack, I'd say, yeah, I was scared. Uncle Press guided the motorcycle toward one of the old-fashioned kiosks and that marked the stairs leading down to the subway. We bounced up onto the curb, and he killed the engine. As we glided to a stop, suddenly everything became quiet. Granted, I'd been riding on the back of a motorcycle for the past half hour, and after that, anything would seem quiet. But this was really quiet, like a ghost town or a ghost city. This is it, he announced, and jumped off the bike. I jumped off too, and gratefully removed my helmet. Finally, I could hear again. Uncle Press left his le helmet on the bike and headed for the subway entrance. Whoa, hold on. We're going to leave the bike and the helmet? I asked with surprise. I couldn't believe it. He didn't even take the keys out of the ignition. I'm no expert on crime, but I took pretty much I could pretty much predict that if we left this gear here, it would be gone before we blinked. We don't need it anymore, he said quickly and started down the subway stairs. Why are we taking the subway? I asked, why don't we just stay on the bike? Because we can't take the bike where we are going. He answered with a matter-of-fact tone. He turned and headed down a few more steps. I didn't move. I wanted answers, and I wasn't taking another step until I got some. Uncle Press sensed that I wasn't following him, so he stopped and looked back at me. What? He asked with a little bit of frustration. I just blew off the most important game of my life. My team is going to crucify me tomorrow. And you want me to follow you into the subway in the worst part of the New York City? I think I deserve to know what's going on. This had gone far enough. And if I didn't get some answers, I was walking. Of course, I wasn't exactly sure of where I would go if Uncle Press left me there and went on alone. I figured it was a safe risk, though. After all, he was my uncle. Uncle Press softened. For a moment, I saw the face of a guy I'd known all my life. You're right, Bobby. I've asked you to do a lot on faith. But if we stop for me to explain everything, we may be too late. Too late for what? There's a group of people who are in trouble. They are relying on me to help them. And I'm relying on you to help me. I was flattered and freaked at the same time. Really? What kind of trouble? 
That's what would take me forever to explain. I'd rather show you. I didn't know what to do. Even if I wanted to run away, I had no clue of how to get out of there. there. And here was the sky. My uncle staring me straight in the eye and saying he needed me. There weren't a lot of options. I finally decided to divulge the single overriding thought in my head. I'm scared. There, I said it. I know, but please believe me, Bobby. As long as it's in my power, I won't let anything happen to you. He said this with such sincerity, it actually made me feel better. For about a second. What happens when it's not in your power? I asked. Uncle Press smiled and said, That won't be for a while. Are you with me? They say just before you're about to meet your doom, your life flashes before your eyes. Surprisingly, that didn't happen. I didn't think of the game. I didn't think of my family. I didn't even think of Courtney Chetwind. I just thought about me and Uncle Press. Here and now, I took that as a good sign. So I mustered all the bravado I could and said, Hey ho, let's go. Uncle Press let out a laugh like I hadn't heard from him in a long time, then turned and rushed down the stairs. As I watched him disappear into the dark hole of the subway, I did my best to pretend I wasn't being an idiot by going along with him. When I got to the bottom of the stairs, I saw Uncle Press standing in front of a wall of graffiti-covered plywood that blocked the entrance. The station was closed, and by the looks of the old wood, it had been closed for a long time. Well, that's a problem, I said glibly. No, go on, right? No go, right? Uncle Press turned to me, and with the sincerity of a sage teacher, imparting golden words of wisdom, he said, There are no problems, only challenges. Well, if the challenge is to catch a subway to a station that's closed, I countered, then I'd say that's a problem. But not for Uncle Press. He casually reached toward the wall with one hand, grabbed one of the boards, and gave it a yank. It didn't seem as if he pulled all that hard, but instantly four huge boards pulled loose in one piece, opening up an avenue into the darkened station. Who, who has anything about catching a subway? Who said anything about catching a subway? He asked with a sly smile. He effortlessly dropped the large section of board on the stairs and stepped inside. I had no idea Uncle Press was that strong. I also had no idea why we were stepping into a closed subway station at night in the worst section of the city. Uncle Press then poked his head back out. Coming? I was half a breath away from turning, running up the stairs, and giving myself a crash course in motorcycle driving. But I didn't. Chances are the bike was already stolen away. I had no choice, so I followed him. The station had been closed for a long time. The only light came from the street lamps that flit filtered down through the grates in the sidewalk. The soft glow cast a cr criss-cross pattern across the walls that threw the rest of the station into darkness. It took a while for my eyes to adjust, but when they did, I saw a forgotten piece of history. At one time, this was probably a busy station. I could make out ornate mosaic tile work on the walls that must have been beautiful when new, but was now a mess of grimy cracks that looked like a giant dirty spiderweb. Garbage was everywhere, benches were overturned, and the glass around the token booth was shattered. In a word, it was sad. And I stood on top of the cement stairs. The derelict station began to show signs of life. It started as a faint rumble that slowly grew louder. The station may have been closed, but the subway trains still ran. I saw the headlight first as it beamed into the opening. 
lighting up the track and the walls. Then the train came, fast. There was no reason to stop at this station anymore, so it rumbled through like a shot, on its way to somewhere else. For a brief moment, I could imagine the station as it had looked in better days. But just as quickly, the image was gone, along with the train. In an instant, the place was deathly quiet again. The only sign that the train had been through was a swirling piece of crusty paper caught in a slipstream. I looked to Uncle Press to see if he were appreciating this forlorn piece of new, old New York history, the same as I was. He wasn't. His eyes were sharp and focused. He quickly scanned the empty station, looked for something. I didn't know what, but I definitely sensed that he just noted, just not notched up. But I definitely sensed that he had just notched up into DEFCON 2. He was on full alert, and it didn't do much to put me at ease. What was all I could think of asking? He stared quickly down the stairs. I was right after him. Listen, Bobby, he said quickly, as if he didn't have time, much time. If anything happens, I want to know what to do. I want you to know what to do. Happens? What do you mean happens? This didn't sound good. Everything will be fine if you know what to do. We're not here to catch a train. We're here because this is where the gate is. Gate? What gate? At the end of the platform are stairs that lead down to the tracks. About 30 yards down the track, along the wall, there's a door. It's got a drawing on it like a star. Things were going a little fast now for me. Uncle Press kept walking quickly, headed for the far end of the platform. I had to dodge around pillars and overturn garbage cans to keep up with him. You with me? He asked sharply. Yeah, I said. Stairs, door, star, why are we? The door is the gate. If for some reason I'm not with you, open the door, go inside, and say, Dendron. Denda what? Dendron. Say it. Dendron. I got it. What is it? Some kind of password? It'll get us where we're going. Okay, could... Okay, could this have been any more mysterious? Why didn't we just say abracadabra or something equally stupid? I was beginning to think this was all some kind of big old joke. Why are you telling me this? I asked nervously. We're going there together, right? That's the plan. But if anything, stop right there. Uh-oh, we weren't alone. We both stopped short and whipped around to see a cop busted for what I'm not sure trespassing, I guess. You boys want to you boys want to tell me what you're doing here down here? The cop looked confident. No, cocky. He was a clean cut guy with a perfect cocky colored uniform, a big badge and an even bigger gun. At least it was still in its holster. Even though we were busted, I was actually kind of relieved to see him. To be honest, Uncle Press was starting to freak me out. I didn't think he'd gone off the deep end or anything, but this adventure was getting strange by the second. Maybe now that the cop was here, he'd have to explain things a little better. I looked up to Uncle Press, expecting him to answer the cop. I didn't like what I saw. Uncle Press was staring the cop down. I could sense the wheels turning in his head, calculating. But what, an escape? I hope not. The gun on the cop's hip looked nasty. There was a long moment of silence, like a standoff, and then somebody else joined the party. Can't you leave me in peace? We all shot a look over a dark corner where a pile of garbage sat. At least, it looked like a pile of garbage, until it moved, and I saw that it was a homeless dude. Correction, he had a home, and we were standing in it. He was a big guy, and I had no idea how old he was because I saw, all I saw was a tangle of hair and rags. 
He didn't smile so good either. He pulled himself to his feet and shuffled toward us. When he spoke, it was with a kind of slurred, crazy speak. Peace. That's all I want. Little peace. Little quiet, he jabbered. Uncle Press squared off and stood firm, glancing quickly back and forth between the cop and the homeless guy. He was thinking fast, calculating. I think you two better come with me, the cop said to us, calmly. He wasn't rattled by the new arrival. I looked to Uncle Press. He didn't move. The homeless guy got closer. Castle, this is my castle. I want you all to... What? asked Uncle Press. What do you want us to do? I couldn't believe he was trying to talk to this crazy guy. Then the platform started to rumble. Another subway train was on its way. I want you all to go away. Leave me alone. For some reason, this made Uncle Press smile. Now I was totally confused. Whatever he was trying to calculate, he had his answer. He turned away from the homeless guy and faced the cop. You don't know this territory, you don't know this territory do you? He said to the cop. Huh? Was that supposed? What was that supposed to mean? Behind us, the light from the subway train started to leak into the station. It would be here in a few seconds. The homeless guy started waving his arms in emphasis. You! I'm talking to you! I want you out of my castle! He yelled at the cop. I was afraid the cop would pull his gun on the guy for his own protection, but he didn't. He just stood there, staring at Uncle Press. They looked like two gunslingers, each waiting for the other to blink. Then he gave a little smile and said, What was your first clue? The uniform city cops in this territory wear blue, not cocky, answered Uncle Press. This guy wasn't a cop. Then who was he? The train horn blared and the screech of, screeching of metal wheels on tracks grew, grew closer. I'm flattered, though, said Uncle Press calmly. You came yourself. Uncle Press knew who this guy was. The homeless guy kept getting closer to the cop, or whoever he was. That's it. That's it. If you don't get, get now, I'm gonna. Suddenly, the cop snapped a look at to the homeless guy. It was a cold look that made me catch my breath. It stopped the homeless guy in his tracks. The cops stared at him with an intense intensity I'd never seen. The guy froze, then began to shake like he had a fever. The subway horn blasted. The train was almost in the station. The homeless guy looked as if he wanted to get away, but the cops' laser-like gaze had him locked in place. Then something happened that I won't forget as long as I live, though I wish I could. The homeless guy opened his mouth and let out a horrifying anguish cry. Then he ran, but he didn't run away. He ran for the tracks. The train entered the station in a blur, and this guy was running towards it. No, stop, I shouted, but it didn't matter. The homeless guy kept running and jumped in front of the train. I turned away at the last second, but that didn't stop me from hearing it. It was a sickening thud, and his scream was suddenly cut off. The train didn't even stop. I'll bet no one on board knew what had happened, but I did, and I wanted to puke. I looked to Uncle Press, who had a pained look. He wiped it away in the next instant and looked back to the cop who stood there with a smug little smile. That was beneath you, St. Dane, said Uncle Press through clenched teeth. Saint Dane. That was the first time I had heard the name. I had the grim, grim feeling it wouldn't be the last. The cop Saint Dane gave an innocent little shrug and said, just wanted to give the boy a taste of what is in store for him. I didn't like the sound of that. And then Saint Dane began to transform. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. But it was real. His face, his clothes, everything about him changed. 
I watched in absolute stupefied awe as he became a different person. His hair grew long and straight till it was over his shoulders. His body grew until he was nearly seven feet tall. His skin became ghostly pale white. His clothes changed from the cocky brown cop uniform to an all-black suit that vaguely reminded me of Far East. But none of that mattered as much as his eyes. His eyes grew icy blue and flashed with an evil intensity that made me understand the sheer force of will he possessed that could make somebody jump to their deaths in front of a speeding train. There was only one thing that didn't change. He still had a gun. And I was surprised to discover so did Uncle Press with an expertise that made me feel as if he had done the sort of thing many times before. Uncle Press reached into his long coat and pulled out an automatic. St. Dane went for his gun as well. I stood frozen. Ever hear the term deer in the headlights? That was me. I couldn't move. The next thing I knew, I was on my butt on the floor. Uncle Press had shoved me down beneath a wooden bench. We were protected from St. Dane, but for how long? Uncle Press looked at me in a a voice that was way more calm than the situation warranted. He said one simple word. Run. But what about run? He then dove out from behind the protection, protection of the bench and started shooting. I stayed there long enough to see St. Dane dive behind a pillar for protection. Uncle Press was a pretty good shot because the tiles on the pillar splintered and shattered as they were slammed with his bullets. It was clear what he was doing. He was keeping St. Dane occupied to give me time to run. But run where? Bobby, the door! Right, the door with the star and the abracadabra. Got it. I started to crawl away. Then Uncle Press called me. Watch out for the quigs. Huh? What was a quig? Bang. A a tile shattered right near my head. St. Dane was now shooting back. And I was the target. That's all the encouragement I needed. I ran. Behind me, the sound of blast from the gun battle rang through the empty station. It was deafening. I ran past a pillar. And bang. A bullet pulverized another tile. Pieces of flying tile stung the back of my neck. That's how close it was. I got to the far end of the platform and saw the stairs leading down to the tracks. As Just as Uncle Press described, I stopped for a second, thinking I'd have to be crazy to crawl down onto the subway tracks. But the alternative was worse. It would be easier facing a subway train than the St. Dane guy. So I took a quick breath and climbed down the stairs. Once I was down on the tracks, the gun battle seemed far away. I still heard the occasional crack of a gun, but I was now more concerned about what was in front of me than behind. For a moment, I thought I should go back and help Uncle Press, but jumping into the middle of a blazing gun battle didn't seem like a good idea. I could only hope that he could handle the situation. The only thing I could do was follow his instructions. It was dark. I had to feel my way along the greasy wall to make sure I didn't accidentally step on the tracks. I'd heard about the infamous electric third rail that powered the trains. If you stepped on that thing, you were a beacon. So I stayed on close to the wall as I could. Uncle Press said the store was about 30 yards down from the platform. I tried to picture a football field to visualize how far 30 yards were. It didn't help. I figured I'd just keep moving until my hand hit this mysterious door. My biggest fear was that I'd miss it. And then, grrr, a grumble came from behind me. What was that? Was it a train? Was it power surging through the third rail? It was neither, because I heard it again, and it came from a different direction. It sounded like growling, but I didn't think rats growled, so I couldn't be rats. 
Good thing I hated rats. I looked around slowly, and in the dim dark, I saw something that nearly made my heart stop. Across the tracks, looking straight at me, were a pair of eyes. They were low to the ground and caught the light in such a way that it made them flash yellow. It was some kind of animal. Could this be a quib? Uncle Press had told me to watch out, out for, or maybe it was a wild dog. Whatever it was, it was big, and it had friends, because more eyes appeared. It was a pack of animals gathering, and their growling told me that they weren't friendly. Gulp. My plan was to do everything I could not to threaten them. I decided to move very slowly, very deliberately, and make my way toward the door. And, grrr, too late. The entire pack of dogs, or quibs, or whatever they were, leaped from the shadows and charged me. Suddenly, the third rail didn't seem all that dangerous. I turned and ran. There must have been a dozen of them. I could hear their teeth gnashing and their claws scratching on the metal rail as they bounded over one another to get to me. And, and I didn't want to think that what would happen if they did. I remember having a fleeting thought that maybe they'd hit the third rail and vaporize, but that didn't happen. My only hope was finding the door. It was so dark, I kept tripping over stones and garbage and railroad ties and everything else down there. But I kept going. I had no choice. If I fell, I was a kibble. Then, like a lifeline to a drowning man, I saw it. The only light come, came from the dirty old bolts strung above the tracks. But it was enough for me to see. Receded into the cement wall was a small door with a faint star shape carved into the wood. This was it. I ran up to the door only to discover there was no door handle. I couldn't open it. I looked back and saw the pack of animals nearby on me. I only had a few more seconds. I leaned my weight against the door and it opened. The door opened in, in, not out. I fell inside and quickly scrambled back to close the door just as slam, slam, slam. The animals hit the door. I leaned back on the door, desperate to keep them out, but they were strong. I could hear their claws feverishly scratching on the wooden door. I couldn't keep them out for long. Now I'm going to stop my story here, Mark, because that... What happened next was far more important than those animals who were trying to get me. I know, hard to believe, but it was obviously the wild dogs, or the quips, or whatever they're called, didn't get me. If they had, I wouldn't be writing this. Duh. I think what happened next was the single most important event in this whole nightmare. As scary and as strange as everything was that had happened, up till then, there was no way I could have been prepared for what was waiting for me beyond the door. While I was trying to keep the animals out, I looked at the pace, space I just entered. What I saw was a long, dark tunnel. It wasn't big, maybe about six feet high. The walls were made of craggy, slate, gray rock. It didn't look as if it were drilled out by a machine either. It was crude, like someone dug the tunnel with hand tools. I couldn't see how far the tunnel went back, because it dropped off into blackness. It couldn't have gone on forever. It could have gone on forever. I didn't know what to do. If I tried to run down the tunnel, the instant I left the door, the animals would burst in and be on me. Not a good move. I was stuck. But then I remembered what Uncle Press had told me. There was a word. He had said to go inside and say this word. He had said it would get us to where we were going. What was that word? Denison? Dandelion? Dandruff? I couldn't really see how saying a hocus pocus word could get me out of this predicament. But it was the only choice I had. Then I remembered it. Dendron. It meant nothing to me. But if it was going to get me out of this... It would be my favorite word in the world. So I put my back to the door, planted my feet, looked into the dark tunnel, and shouted out, Dendron! Instantly, the animals stopped feeding against the door. 
It didn't sound like they ran away. They were just suddenly not there. I took a chance and stepped away from the door, and nothing happened. At least nothing happened with the door. The tunnel was another thing altogether. It started as a hum. It was low at first, but the frequency started to grow. I looked into the tunnel and watched in wonder as the walls started to twist and move. I was looking down the barrel of a huge flexible living pipeline. Then the walls started to change. They went from solid gray to clear. These craggy walls suddenly looked as if they were made of crystal or diamonds. Light was everywhere, as if it were coming right from the walls themselves. It was truly an amazing sight. So amazing that it didn't st I didn't stop to wonder what it all meant. That's when I heard the music. It was a recognizable tune or anything. It wasn't a recognizable tune or anything. It was just a bunch of sweet, soft notes that were all jumbled up. It was almost hypnotic. The mixed up notes grew louder and louder as if they were coming closer. The thing that brought me back to myself was a strange sensation. I stood at the mouth of the tunnel and fe felt a tingling through my body. It wasn't horrible, just strange. The tingling grew stronger, as if an old but unmistakable tug. I didn't realize it at first, but it soon dawned on me that I was being pulled into the tunnel. Some giant invisible hand had gotten hold of me and was pulling me in. I tried to back away, but the force grew stronger. Now I started to panic. I turned and tried to find something, anything to grab onto. I fell down and dug my nails onto the ground, but nothing worked. I was being sucked into the horrible tunnel, and there was nothing I could do to stop it. This is the point. This is where my life changed. What happened next turned everything I had ever known, everything I had ever believed in, everything I had, I had ever thought to be real, totally inside out. I got sucked into the rabbit hole, Mark, and, and I was headed for Wonderland.